Well, hey, Daniel, we're back here on Ridge Talk, and last episode, we had a discussion related to cultural Christianity. We did. We gave a definition for that, which was the idea that uh, for a lot of our lifetimes, uh, actually all of our lifetimes, right. and, and through some previous generations, back through, especially through the 1950s and, and through that time period and forward, that Christianity would have been a familiar thing to people in our culture. Uh, people would have generally had a, a, an understanding of its basic concepts, ideas, and familiarity with stories, um, and that some of the values of Christianity largely informed the larger values of society. Yeah, it was just assumed. Yeah. And so part of the result of that was that we had churches full of people who maybe had great attendance, but not everybody was completely bought in with following the way of Jesus. It was more of, uh, this is a common thing in the culture. This is a good thing to do. Um, and so we- It's just what people do, and it's, it could even be advantageous for business could be, or could be for, social you know, outlet. That's exactly um, right. It could, it could even have been, um, you know, I want to bring my kids around this environment because it teaches good morals. Right, right. Um, those types of things. But it really <clears throat> wasn't. I want to follow Jesus. And what we recognize that that actually means is a, a tremendous amount of sacrifice. It is um, laying your life down for the mm. sake of Jesus is different than, oh, I attend a church. Mm. And so with that in mind, we're going to follow up with another question today. And here's what it is. So, in light of the fact that there are cultural Christians um, in our past, but yet we've moved away from cultural Christianity as a country, as a society, um, the balance of uh, the representation of our society is shifting rapidly. It's moving from where we would have assumed that the majority of people in our context would have some familiarity with Christianity maybe have some affinity for it or respect some of the values. Now we're moving into, I would say it's probably realistic to say in the next decade that our society will be made up more of people who are non-Christians, who have no exposure to Christianity, and who may even be hostile to the basic ideas and values yeah, of Yeah, that's not an unreasonable assumption. <laughs> I think we're on pace for that. We've yeah. seen that accelerated in the last several years. One of the things that um, people seem to be trying to come to grips with right now are just the the major cultural shifts that are happening for various reasons. And so we find ourselves in the midst of that type of a context, Yes, a rapidly changing world where our values uh, uh, and the things that we believe uh, lead to human flourishing that set people as up- As Christians. To, yeah, as Christians. Uh, those things are, are losing sort of their- uh, cultural grip that they once had, they're losing their influence, and and in some spheres are actually um, vulnerable to criticism, to attack, to just being thrown out altogether oh, as sure. being uh, not good for society, not good for people. That's kind of the world that we find ourselves in. And so, all of that be con being considered... Uh, there's an idea that I think is accurate, that the church is going to have to change the way it approaches ministry in that type of a culture. Because largely, I think that we've been able to um, exist as congregations, build a building, uh, have our normal services that we would invite people to. Uh, have events and have community outreaches and things that would sort of like get people uh, familiar with who we are, and maybe draw them to us. But really, like we, it, it's been said, and I don't really disagree with this type of idea that in a lot of ways, the approach of like, if we build it, they will come mm. idea worked for a long time. It's not that it was ineffective, but I think what we're acknowledging now is that's probably not going to be nearly as effective moving forward into this type of a culture. That's right. And so the church is going to have to respond. The church is going to have to ch kind of change the way uh, it approaches the world. And that doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean that we stop doing uh, things like we've done in the past. We would never say, okay, we're going to stop meeting together regularly. Um, for, for us culturally, that's usually been Sunday mornings. Uh, we wouldn't make the argument that that's going to go away. Um, no, we've been never. a church who has followed a model that has used 
uh, small groups or community groups, yep. which is people gathering in each other's homes in smaller groups, um, really trying to build relationship on a deeper level with each other to not only have um, uh, an increased amount of growth within themselves, but hopefully then to to kind of spur each other on to greater ministry outside of their own homes and even outside of the the walls of a church building. And then we've had community outreach that we've done where we've <laughs> either directly tried to support needs or we've supported local uh, institutions, groups who are ministering to people, and we've come alongside them financially or with people on the ground or in other ways to support things that are happening there. Like all of those things are elements of what we done, what we've done to try to minister. And then the last piece of that being we've sent missions teams out um, internationally. We support missionaries around the world. Like all of those mm. are essentially the the basic elements of how we've approached ministry here at Southridge. And really that's been like the prevailing model of how churches in, in America have operated. So that's a long setup for this question, but I think it's important. I think context is important to yeah, say, absolutely. this is how we've done things. These are the elements of, of really what the American church has, has said is valuable, important, and what has worked. And now we have to look at all of those basic elements and say, how do we combine those moving forward to reach a world mm. who increasingly has no idea who Jesus is, is not going to even really have any value for hearing uh, the Christian perspective, and then maybe upon hearing the Christian perspective might actually be hostile toward it. Uh, so here's the question. I'll finally read it, because I know you've been waiting <laughs> with bated breath. Um, where do we want to go in balancing efforts among Sunday morning gatherings— meeting in homes, going out into the community, and going beyond. So as it relates back to there being fewer cultural Christians um, and a society that is either hostile toward the church or has had bad church experiences, is dealing with um, hurt related to the church. So how do we uh, look at all of that and combine those things or balance those things or use them toward ministering to the world around us? Yeah. So the first, uh, the very first thing in that, the very first like premise in that question is where do we want to go? Yeah. And so I want to say like just starting off, uh, when I answer the question, we, I'm talking about Southridge church. Yeah. Um, and I, I think of course, I mean, I, I, you and I are talking and the way you premised that and kind of like started everything we're talking about the, on the grand scale globally and even yeah. like nationally, um, but I can't make decisions for churches around the world or nationally. I can just, you know, we, we can do what we can here at Southridge. And so yeah. well, how do we move forward? Uh, you know, part of that, we're already doing all, we're already doing all of those things, uh, as far as we gather here and then we're already meeting in homes and have community groups. And then we are doing things out in the community and going out abroad. Um, but, but the, I think the impulse of the question is good because, um, the question really is, and it's, it's getting at this idea, uh, it, it ended with that question about cultural Christianity, uh, and the idea that like church attendance was just assumed and that yeah. like, I think what you said earlier, if we build, if we build it, they'll come. Yeah. Um, and, and that was largely related to <clears throat> a Sunday morning service too. Correct. Like that would have been the main idea of, of what it would mean. Like it, what they'll come, they may not have been coming to other programs, might not have been part of a community group, but certainly well, like the measure could have been, Hey, we've got 500 people here on a Sunday. Depending morning. on when you talk about, I mean, you, you take the Catholic church all the way back into uh, medieval times. Like the church was the center of your life. Yeah, it was. You spent not just Sundays there. You spent almost every day there. There was something involved uh, in America. Uh, Honestly, it was very similar, but certainly from the 1950s through the end of the last century, um, you did see that it was it was it wasn't just Sunday morning. It was Sunday morning. It was Sunday night. Yeah. It was Wednesday night, and it was probably one other time throughout the week. But this was kind of that was more assumed for a, a period of time, uh, and like you've already said, that's even among professing Christians who genuinely love and know Jesus, that kind of centering your life around and organizing your life and your calendar around the events of the church, yeah. it's not really a thing anymore. We we were filling people's calendars uh, and we've kind of stopped doing that as a society. Most Many churches have stopped doing that. Um, 
Sean, I love uh, board games. I'm a big, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a gamer in that sense. I love board games. I love strategy games. I like puzzles and yeah. like solving those kind of things. Uh, and one of the things that's true, some of my favorite games, it's true in Monopoly. No one ever plays Monopoly with me. I don't know why. <laughs> Probably get too competitive. Monopoly, Catan. Uh, there's a bunch of games I love playing. But uh, one of the principles that you just have to know going in, especially with strategy games, uh, the, the rule is adapt or die. Okay. And you know that's but that's yeah. true in life. Adapt or die. Yeah. Uh, and when it when you apply that uh, to the church, it, 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 if the church says we're all we're going to keep doing things the way we've always done them, that's that's an issue. That those churches yeah. typically die. They uh, uh, and it, I think there's a bit of confusion there um, between in the terms we've used here. We've talked about it before: is so orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Yeah, churches churches that change orthodoxy or right belief, they say we're not just going to believe that way because it's been that way for thousands of years. That's foolish, right? right. Orthodoxy, we want to remain orthodox. Don't don't dismiss ancient teachings. Don't dismiss the word of God, but how it is applied. Yeah can change the way you practice those those orthodox belief i think that's the aspect that has to adapt um and so i think in some ways uh cultural christianity in in america particularly was informed uh by so many things the uh entertainment industry uh, r- rose significantly during that period from the yeah. 1950s forward. So did uh, business. Business was a big deal before the 1950s, right? But but the church began to model itself after certain business practices. It yeah. became uh, uh, even the emphasis on organism diminished and the emphasis on the organization <laughs> increased, right? And so we're an organization yeah, more than we are an can of worms. organism, right? And so that's probably a whole other uh, episode. But... Um, Man, I, I, I do think that with regard to how you reach the culture, it, I think the name of the game really is adapt or die. Yeah. And um, so the things we were talking about earlier of the building will come, there was a time when you literally could just open the doors of the church and people would walk in. Yeah. And you could fill it up. Uh, and that's, and of course I'm oversimplifying. That's, that's, I don't, you know, that's not exactly how it worked out, but uh, it, it was more that way. Yeah. Um, and it is not that it's not that way now and it is becoming less that way uh and so i think with our language um we have to change the way we talk about things not what we're talking about but how we communicate it yeah. is important um because communicating the right ideas with the wrong language is just going to fall on deaf ears or people are going to be confused and they're not going to know what you're talking about and, yeah um, so changing our language, changing, um, uh, even the media that we use in order to get things out, I think is important. But then I, I think there are some timeless realities. The question really got at our gatherings, what Sunday morning and in homes, um, and then how we reach people out outside of that. Um, you know, you, you look at the early church, you look in the scriptures, they did gather together in one large group and people are like, oh, they didn't have buildings. They did have buildings. They had synagogues and they had places yeah. they were meeting uh, in the very earliest <laughs> days. Um, but but they also met in homes, like daily is what yeah. Acts 2 talks about. You know, there, there was this sense of hospitality and community. Uh, and I think in, in, in my understanding, God is a relational God, Right. He, we have a, tr- a Trinitarian God, so even before creation, God is in relationship with himself, right? They're the three in one. Uh, and then creating us in his image, he created us as relational beings, and that never goes away. Yeah. That is a timeless, infinite, eternal reality that people are made and designed to experience community with one another and with God. And so um, I, I think what we're going to see more and an emphasis that we're, I'm going to continue pushing, and I think we uh, at Southridge, we're definitely going to continue pushing, is the necessity of being in those small groups, being in community groups for yeah. your spiritual health and vitality. Um, it, it, ha- it has to be. It has to be a part of your walk uh, uh, el- or else you, you're not getting, you're not going to flourish in the ways that, that you... You will flourish in ways that you would not if you're only going to church once a week, right? You're going yeah. gathering with people and you're being filled up there. Um, in some ways, the front door of the church is also the front door of your home. I absolutely agree with that. Um, we do a lot of discussion at the staff level, um, you know, in meetings and and even just in personal study 
that deals with a lot of, uh, like, we like to be data informed. And so we use things like the Barna Group, which is a Christian social research group. Mm. They're actually um, are, are pretty a pretty top-notch organization yeah, at are. gathering data and, and giving a, an accurate assessment of where the culture is, how things are shifting. They are great at coming up with um, uh, snapshots of what generations look like and what they want. And so I've done a lot of reading, and I know you have as well, and, and even Luch, we've had discussions um, about Gen Z, you know, the the group that really is next in line to sort of inherit the church. Um, and we're seeing kind of what they value, what they are, are drawn to, and what we're seeing time and time again is that the idea of uh, a church service that is reliant on flashy videos, great lights, great music. Uh, I say this as a worship director who that's been like what I've stewarded for years. Uh, We're actually seeing that they really aren't drawn by that anymore. No. So (laughs) at our, I don't know, we talk about this at our, uh, we had a baptism service a few weeks back and one of the girls uh, who got baptized, she's a a college freshman. So she's definitely in the Gen Z category. Uh, Her her testimony was read and then her sister said, oh, and she's going to be real. And then like at the end, (laughs) right after she got baptized, she took a be real photo. For those of you who don't know what be real is, I don't really know either, but it's, 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 it is a social media app and the whole premise behind it is uh stop stop giving us this curated version of your life yeah right where like every photo is i think there's no filters in it i mean i don't have the app i probably maybe i should get it but there's there's no filters and really if you're actually participating in it uh there's at a random time of day I think be real sends out a like prompt, like now's your time to be real. And then whatever you're doing, if your hair's a mess, if you don't got your makeup on, uh, I never have my makeup on. Right. But like, uh, you know, if you're filthy, whatever, whatever, you have you're a doing. big piece of cat hair stuck. You got to the a big back piece of, of cat you, hair like stuck on about you five minutes ago. If you're like chewing <laughs> like on like a taco or something. I don't know. Whatever that is, you're supposed, you've got like a minute to like to fl- uh, take a photo and yeah. then it goes out and the and but it gets at this idea that exactly what you're saying that uh the younger generation Gen Z wants authenticity yeah they want often they don't want the curated flashy i say that but i think there's a hypocrisy even i'm not calling an entire generation of people hip- hypocritical but but there's both there is a an innate desire for just be real with me yeah. and yet some of the like least real things out there still get all the you yeah. know attention. So that's shifting for sure. Um, in that example too, I think that um, we're going to have to be increasingly open-handed correct. with things. And so, as far as a Sunday service would go, starting there, I think that we're going to have to be willing to allow that to shift as far as the elements that compose it. And we're actually having some of those conversations. Here's the interesting thing. We're looking back at um, more ancient practices like liturgy. We've talked about several times on this podcast, catechism, things like that, that um, help us to embody, like literally with our bodies, participate Mm -hmm. in things. Um, Less of coming to church and having a program that can be passively observed, and more coming to church in an environment that encourages, if not requires, active participation by everybody there. That seems to be the the things that Gen Z is more drawn to, and that we would say there's already historical precedent for that in the church. It's not a new thing. Mm. It's not some wild idea. It's actually looking back to some of the things that held value in the church in the past and seeing that they're coming back around, um, that people are finding the value in them. And and I would say as somebody, like my, my job title, as we've said before, is worship and programming director. And I, in some ways, want to drop the idea of programming director because it almost like 
implies that, hey, this is just a program to come sit and watch. And when the program's over, it's you can stand driven. up and right. leave and it's all done. And like that is the furthest thing from mm-hmm. what I want uh, a, a, a gathering of our congregation to be. I want it to be something that brings people together, encourages them to participate actively with one another, but then also provides the the fuel to actually go out from here and minister to their neighbor. And I think that's the next part that I would like to to touch on is the idea of, you know, we talk about meeting in homes with community groups, and that has a huge value. It, it deepens relationships in our congregation. But I would say, if that's all the further that ever goes, it's still just self-serving. Mm. It's still like, well, we want to grow for our own sake. But then if those groups aren't figuring out how to reach out beyond themselves to those around them, then they're really kind of just this self facing thing. And what we continually say and how we try to evaluate ministries at Southridge Church is we want them to be effective, not only for the people who are here, but we want to be an outward facing church. And so I think another thing that we have to realize is that as we're open-handed with things like a Sunday morning service, right. we're going to have to be open-handed with things like our own time. Mm. Because the impulse for me and I think for most of our society, is we all now have very comfortable air-conditioned homes. We can order food and have it <clears> delivered. <throat> we can order groceries and have them right. delivered. Uh, I, I'm i very introverted, and so by the time I get to my house, I'm kind of ready for a little bit of recharging. and And so I can just get home, go into my house, disappear, turn on Netflix, turn on YouTube, spend the rest of my evening inside my house, never knowing my neighbor, never, let alone inviting them over, any of those things. But I, I don't think that we can really understand what it is to follow Jesus in a deep way if we're not st- moving toward uh, doing those types of things. I think as kind of a core, at its core, like I think a summary statement of kind of the point we're making here is that we want to move away from consumeristic, or consumerism, and yeah. in more in uh, that mindset, a consumeristic mindset, uh, and move into a participation mindset. Yeah. And, and, and quite frankly, that's currently that is a countercultural emphasis, right? Yeah. And I think that it, it's definitely the what's <clears throat> weird about it is it's countercultural to church culture of the last 20 years Correct. by and large. Correct. Because we had I think part of what the church has to do in these days is acknowledge where we went off the tracks a little bit in our approach. One of the like one of the reasons that we've lost uh, some influence in the culture is not just well everything's evil and it's all turning on us. Some of it is we've dropped the ball or yep, we've yep. emphasized the wrong things or we've had our eye on the wrong things. And I think one of those things is that in what started out as a great intention, which was let's try to make. We want to invite our friends and neighbors to know Jesus. Well, how do we do that? The answer to that question, by and large, was we need to get them to come to church, Mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm. And so then in the effort to try to get them to come to church, we began to make our services uh, more attractive. We've used that term, attractional church. So we add in cooler lights and better music, and we we do things that... Yeah, the coffee's great. Uh, We have app controlled thermostats to make sure the temperature's just right. Like I'm being a little facetious there, but we but actually we, do have app control air do. conditioning here in the church. And <laughs> so like all that to say the best of intentions, right? Let's have let's be respectful of people's time. So let's program things to a tight 60 to 70 minutes so that they can move on. What crept in with that though was was more of an ability to have that passive 
consumer experience mm. because we did create programs <clears throat> in an effort to to capture people's attention in an effort to utilize and leverage some of the best things in media to try to reach people. I think what we ended up doing is we surpassed the usefulness of those tools and we we got into some of the shadow side of them where if we're not intentional about things, we can now it just becomes this routine thing that we can check out, we can just sort of watch this program, passively observe it. It might inspire us towards something, but what we've long acknowledged is that inspiration and transformation are two different things. That's right. And a lot of those things uh, were inspirational, but they didn't end up when we had like an, enough of a rear view lens to, to evaluate how effective were certain things. I think we've realized, Hey, a lot of these things were not as effective as we hoped they would be. Some of that just comes with time. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like we could be aware of all of it in real time and go, Oh, we're going to continue leaning into these things that aren't effective. We just didn't know what the fruit of some of those things were. Now I think we have the ability to stand here as our society has changed rapidly in the last three years um, to say, uh, hey, like certain things in attractional church did nothing more than inspire people and the shine has worn off of them and it's no longer even enough to get people to come into the door, let alone to stay. And so we're having to say, okay, so what are the core things to Christianity that have stood the test of time throughout the generations? And it is things like active participation, yeah. loving your neighbor, <clears throat> being willing to have people in your home, being willing to adjust your schedule and say no to what may be very good things in order to say yes to something that's better. Mm -hmm. For me, it's not necessarily a question like, hey, is... It's not wrong for me to go home, go in my house, and spend the rest of the evening with my wife mm -hmm. hanging out, mm -hmm. playing games, watching Netflix. Like Nobody would look at that and say, oh, Sean, that's the wrong way of living. Mm. But I think a better way of living is I go home, my neighbor's sitting out on their front porch, I stop, I talk to them, I make plans to invite them over for dinner. Like That type of, of living... Is is the better yes? I agree, I agree. And hey, you know, as we're talking here, Sean, I I want to be sensitive to this. Uh, I don't know who our listeners are. I don't. I really don't know. Yeah. I don't know who all this goes out to. I um, I, it's it's occurring to me that as we're talking about some of this, and I just want to clarify this, that as we're talking about this, number one, we're answering someone's question. Yeah. And the premise involves this idea of cultural Christianity, which we understand. Where we each have our own understanding of what that yeah. means. Um. In our assessment of where we are, and that's that. By the way, that's part of leadership. That's part of like moving into the f future and uh, having a vision for leading people into that future. You have to be able to rightly assess where you are, and you have to be able to rightly assess uh, as best as you can how you arrived at the point you are at. Yeah. Um. And so, but I I realize it could sound to people, especially if we have people who are like. Well, I was around in the 1950s doing youth ministry, and yeah. I was around doing all this, and I, I've been part of this, you know. And, and my story is, I came to faith through an attractional church and yeah. through this, you know, whatever. Um, I, I think it's important that we honor the the ministry, and and I think most people are just doing the best that they can at any given yeah, point absolutely. in time, you know. And they're just, you know, I I, I would like to, I I don't want to, I don't want to in any way devalue uh, what people have done in the past and the ministry they did. I don't want to diminish. And, you know, I don't want people to hear us say, well, you know, our parents and grandparents, they really screwed this whole thing up. Yeah. And, you know, we're we're just fixing all their problems now because that that it could be heard that way. And I don't want to I don't want to do that. Um, but I, I think I, I do think we're rightly assessing uh, the kind of the rise of cultural Christianity and what that looked like for the last, you know, 50 to 70 years. Um, and I think that's important. And I and I think I think that is what we're doing. I think we're coming through and saying we well, we can't keep doing things the way they were done fifty years yeah, ago. Yeah, I think it's more about rightly assessing the limitations and the effectiveness of things. That's right. It's not saying this wasn't effective, but it's it's honestly saying it was effective up to this point, and here's where it stopped being effective, or here's where it actually. Um, I think most things have potential 
to be effective or they can kind of steer you the wrong way. A hundred percent. Because we're influenced, so, we're people who are influenced by... So by, for an instance, yeah. and I think, I don't know if we, I, I'm trying to remember if we talked about this in here or not, but um, this idea of purity culture yeah, uh, being, and something that rose, uh, you know, to prominence maybe in the 1980s, 1990s with things like the True Love Waits uh, conference movement, books like Josh Harris's I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Yeah. It, it was kind of a big, it was a big push yeah. when I was in like uh, middle school and high school and even before that. And the impulse is good. Yeah. The, the Like it's true. The things that it's saying is true. And, and the idea of like, uh, I, God, his design is one man, one woman for life. And that, uh, you know, that we're not promiscuous and that, that does promote human flourishing. And so the impulse was good, the culture, but, but what, what ended up happening is shame yeah. was a big part it of that in introducing that. Culture. And so it actually had the opposite effect of what it was trying. It was yeah. trying to promote godliness and actually it promoted s- something different than that. Yeah. Where, and, and I, I would argue the response to it uh, was worse than what it was initially combating. Yeah. And, um, and it was imbalanced in its application. It, it, it ended correct. up usually being more heavy handed toward, toward females than males, <laughs> more permissive, uh, yeah. you know, like, Oh, this is a guy being a guy will let them off the hook. And then, you know, my, my assessment of it is that a lot more girls who grew up in that felt more of the shame Correct. side of it than, Correct. than the guys were led to feel because of some, some bad cultural things. Like, so if the, that's a good things- example of good intention, it could have been, it, it, there were aspects of it that were <clears throat> effective and trying to keep people from getting into relational yes. messes in their life. But then when you sort of begin to emphasize the wrong things or overemphasize things, it can have an unintended consequence. Correct. And I, I really think the reason <laughs> I shared that as an example um, is I don't know that anyone really could have known that at the beginning of that movement. Right. That that is something that we are able to assess and evaluate after the fact. Yeah. Um, And so uh, I think in the moment, everyone's like, this is a great idea. Because there was... The, the the outworkings of of sexual liberation and uh, the sexual revolution in the late 1960s early 1970s it it was really a problem and um and it, it really did cause some significant issues in our society and so i think the impulse to say hey there's a better way was a good impulse but then if you don't it, it, I the I, if I'm assessing all of purity culture and this isn't an episode about purity culture but the idea is uh I think I think if I were to assess the core issue, it's that instead of trying to combat the effects of the sexual revolution with the gospel, we did it with legalism. Yeah, and 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 when you and that's not the way. We know that like uh, the law only promotes more sin. It points yeah. out our sin, and and because of the rebellion in our hearts, we 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 buffer at it, right? We we yeah. um, and so. Um, yeah, you have to combat those things with the gospel, and so in that sense, it's all it's a timeless. There, it's a timeless answer. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, and yet the application of that, if you're not, if you're not careful with that, yeah, I would say that a, a, a good percentage of what I identified is unintended consequences. Yep. Yep. Hey, this thing was working. It worked for a while. Um, I wouldn't say it's all unintended consequences. I think that. You know, back to something that you hinted at. I think there, there has been a an approach to well, let's uh, let's approach church life um, from like an business organization mm-hmm. perspective. And so, some of the things that we relied on to see growth metrics when we were running things like a business. Uh, actually were things that we should never have leaned into in the first place yeah. that that made it shallow it made it so that we could um, see great numbers in finances and attendance on a Sunday morning that were were not directly tied to spiritual growth and people following Jesus as much as we maybe at the beginning would have would have hoped they would be but I think there there is a, a 
not only necessarily unintended consequences, but a blindness culturally, um, because so much of American culture is, is that sort of, uh, mindset of like, we just need to see up and to the right exactly. growth in everything. Yeah, yeah. And that's never been how the church has worked. No, And so some of it <clears throat> is unintended. Some of it is our own cultural blindness. And some of it is just assessing, hey, what tools are effective? Mm. Um, I'm a motorcycle guy. My dad rides uh, motorcycles from the 1970s that use <laughs> carburetors. Yeah, And we've been out on some trips where that's caused some issues. Um, and all of my bikes that I've had, I've been fuel injected. And I look at that and I go like, I would never at this point choose carburation over fuel injection because mm. of, you know, it, it's the more effective tool for what I want to use now. And it's not to say like my dad gets on his motorcycle and goes where he wants. It's effective, right? right. Like, and in, in its day when it was all that existed, it worked. Mm. And so what I guess the analogy that I'm trying to make there is just to say, like, it's not to say that those things didn't work in their time. And it's not to say that they won't work to a degree Today, now. It's just yeah. what what works better. Have we come up with better tools um, that suit the world that we live in? And I think we have to honestly say to reach Gen Z and a culture that has moved away from Christianity that our tools are going to have to change. We're going to have to refine. doesn't mean we throw everything away, Correct. but we're going to have to add some new <clears throat> ones or some revamped versions of what we've done before. And what here's what I liked about this question. One of the things that they mentioned was just balance. Uh, what do we want to do in balancing the efforts amongst Sunday gatherings, community groups, outreach, and missions. Mm. And I think that's a lot of the question, too, is that we're not even saying we would uh, label any one of those elements as useless at this point or that we are not going to do Or more them. or less important. But we may others. rebalance... Yeah the emphasis of those things, uh, I would certainly think that in some ways community groups are going to need to change um, to to keep up with what the, the needs are, the times that would inspire people. Hey, uh, not only is our community group maybe meeting on Tuesday evening for right. its own study, perhaps maybe again we're meeting on Friday evenings and inviting neighbors from the neighborhood, mm -hmm. like that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I think that just, I, I think leaning into relationships is never a bad thing. <clears throat> yeah. The, the, the challenge is it's even getting more difficult to know how to relate to people, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and we saw that with COVID. We saw that. And, and, and there's, it's just different. It's, it's people are struggling to relate to one another in the same way. Uh, in the same ways that they have previously, and so we have to be smart about how we do that. I think I think vulnerability is good. I think uh, humility is going to go a very long way. Yeah. Cult but cultivating those are things that uh, the, having having love and joy and peace. Those things. I mean, they are fruit of the spirit. Um, humility, but but they're also things that we can cultivate. Right? Yeah. They're things that we can we can actively as we submit to the spirit. Uh, and and say, Lord, will you cultivate these things within me? Um, being real, being authentic, being humble, being generous, being uh, hospitable. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things. I, I said it before, I'll say it again. We're, I think the emphasis is now the front door to our church really needs to be the front door to your house. Yeah. And, and like that's, if you want to see new people coming in, the place to start is not by inviting them to hear me talk. Lord knows that's not going to get them coming back a second time. You know, <laughs> I don't know. But uh <clears throat> but inviting them into your home and getting to know them on a personal level, that's step one. Yep. And I think we're going to lean into that with in every aspect, for our worship gatherings, for our community groups, uh, and, and just even for reaching people. I, I think the bad impulse is um, I'm happy to to like meet people's needs as long as it's over there away from like my, mm -hmm. my sphere. And the idea is... Why? Like, why? Yeah. Like, we let let's let's uh, let's let's bring our worlds together and not. We, that's one of the that's one of the outworkings I think of <laughs> of a number of different things is that we car, we we want to compartmentalize our lives. Yeah, it can't be. Um, you know, we said it earlier, and I didn't say uh, some of the motivation for the if we build it, they will come model was. I'm gonna 
my role is going to be, I'm going to bring my friend or loved one to church so that the pastor or so that other people there can do the rest of the work. To, and I like, don't have to do the relational Jesus. awkwardness. Yeah. And I, that's not, I, I'll just flat out boldly say that's not going to work anymore. I, I don't know that it did work then. I'm not sure that it did. I'm being charitable, but <laughs> it's like, it's definitely not going to, to, <clears throat> to work to influence people anymore. Yeah, they don't, right. because we're living in a society that um, increasingly uh, is not going to look to institutions uh, or or even groups of people uh, to influence them or to uh, add value to their lives. But what we increasingly see is that people still on an individual level crave and recognize that, hey, like a, a relationship with somebody who's real, yep. who's who's authentic. And so like, here's the elephant in the room. I think before in that, if they build it, if we build it, they will come model in a model where um, we were kind of set up as even as church staffs to like, hey, just bring it. Like I was a youth pastor, right? Uh, I ran off of, hey, just bring your friends, just bring mm-hmm. your friends on Wednesday night. And it's almost like what I was saying, that bring your friends, I'll do the rest Yep, yep. to get them to know who Jesus is, at least in that initial thing. I don't like... At this point, what that is going to require is a commitment for people to have some depth in yes. their life well, and, and that, not be reliant on their pastor or anybody else to bring people along. And so what's that going to mean? Saying no to Netflix, saying no to sc- doom scrolling on your phone hours <laughs> right. a night. Like It is going to well, require... And what you're saying is that was the model. Yeah. Just invite them here. Invite them here. I'll talk to them about the gospel. Yeah. And so now you have a generation or two that doesn't know how to share the gospel on their own because the model that they were taught from the stage, from their youth pastor, from their pastor was just get them here. Yeah. You don't worry about it. I'll take care of the rest. And so that's a discipleship issue. It is. That's a formation issue that there are generations of people and we're still doing it. There are still generations of people who don't really know how to share the gospel with with their neighbor and with their loved ones. And um, they're relying on someone else. And so we're going to, as part of what we're doing, how how, the question was, how are we going to balance that? How are we going to move forward? Well, we try to talk about the gospel at every single juncture that we can. And that's one of the ways to be like, here's another example of how you do this. And it's part of the hope of this podcast is that we're delving into specific issues or specific aspects of life and culture that would give people something that would help them in that effort. Mm. Because otherwise, what are we doing? This is self-serving unless what we're doing here is aiding in that effort. That's exactly right. Yeah, so I, I I don't know if if there's much more. I mean, I'm we can talk out. about this <laughs> forever. Um, you know, I know that we didn't get ultra specific in some areas, but we are we are actively in real time assessing these things, assessing the balance of them, mm-hmm. reworking them, trying to get our our mind around uh, really what the needs of of this generation is, but. Here's the here's where I'd like to end. Uh, the more I hear leaders who have direct contact with Gen Z these days, the more I'm encouraged for the future of the church mm-hmm. because they are living in a culturally perilous time, but there are pockets of this generation who are just hungry for Jesus and for a, a humble pursuit of him that involves like really honestly committing themselves to him. And when we've seen that in history, these types of moments where culture shifts and, it, and, and certain things in the church diminish, but yet there's an emerging generation who is serious yep, yep. about and, and humble and willing to repent openly of mm. their sin and willing mm. to confess and willing to just like not be drawn by the things of the world. That's when we see like growth movements in the church. That's when we see God kind of do things beyond what 
uh, we've we've witnessed before. There's a track record of that throughout church history, and I think that we're on the edge of a moment like that. Mm-hmm. I'm so encouraged by uh, just what you hear about when you hear uh, about what Gen Z, those who are following Jesus, are up to. And I'm excited, honestly, in some ways for them to lead us into yeah, the future. Cool. Yeah, cool. Hey, thanks, man. Hey, thanks, bud. See you.